ready to get started. Hello, welcome to DebtNet. Um, we've learned something at this meeting. You really don't want to be the session right after a really nice snack break because no one shows up. So we have much less people in the room than we normally do, but we really appreciate you showing up. Um, uh, it, it will get more done, that's right. So I'm uh, Lou Berger, this is Janos Farkas. We have uh, our secretary, uh, Ethan uh, Grossman here, <laughs> and um, our, welcome to DebtNet. What's that? Okay, can you hear me? Apparently I have to eat the mic. Welcome to DebtNet. Um, our agenda is online, and as is our working uh, group information, please take a look. Uh, this is towards, we, we've been here for a few days, so everyone here should be familiar with the note well. If you're not, please be aware that everything you say here becomes part of our record and that we have rules governing contributions. And if you're unfamiliar with them, please take a look at the URL at the bottom of the page, ietf.org about notewell.html. Um, for the meeting, we are streaming video. Uh, we're recording also. The Everything is available uh, via YouTube or audio download. We're also using our joint minute taking via Etherpad. Please join in and help make sure that your comments are uh, accurately captured um, and uh, just help us out to have accurate minutes. Really appreciate that. The agenda is online and the blue sheets are circulating. Please do sign the blue sheets. That helps both identify who's in the room as well as how big a room we get. Uh, we have two sessions. The first session, uh, you're here now, so thank you. Um, uh, agenda is unmodified. So this has been what's basically been posted for a while. For the second session, this is the second session, great. We've had a little bit of a, a change. The one, uh, number 10 in bold is an addition, a, a late request um, that was added. I think we've been doing a better job of using the list as well as um, uh, uh, incremental meetings or periodic meetings among working group authors. Uh, that the, All of those are advertised on the list and open to all. Uh, we've been doing a pretty good job, but it's really important when there's a discussion uh, to use the list as much as possible. That ensures that, well, for new drafts, it ensures that the working group is aware of what you're doing. For working group drafts, it helps ensure that we have good communication and good agreement in, uh, on the drafts. Um, and as we know, we're here to have a uh, uh, consensus on drafts to submit for publication as RFCs. We follow an IPR disclosure process here. I think most people are familiar with it at this point, but basically we do formal IPR calls at both uh, adoption and last call and um, response by all contributors and authors is required in order to move to the next stage, whether that be adoption or submission to the IESG for publication. Since the last meeting, we've had um, uh, three RFCs published, so that's that's really great. Um, we it, we sort of were a little slow getting going, but now we are um, uh, pushing out documents, which is a uh, a great reflection of the work <laughs> that the those in the room and those on the list have. Uh, uh, helped us achieve, so thank you for all your work. We have a number of documents that uh, have gone through last call. We're gonna talk about status on those, so we don't have to talk about details on them. Um, and uh, they're on the, as I said, they're on the agenda. We have uh, some document, uh, we only have one document that's not on the agenda, that's the bounded latency. Uh, we don't, do we have anyone in the room who is a bounded latency author? Yes. Ethan. Is, do you know what the plan is for, oh, Ashan, sorry, not Ethan, Ashan. What's the plan for the next update of the document? Please come to the mic and let us know. Is 
state your name and tell us what the plan is for the next update. Uh, yes, Esam Mohamad Pur from uh, EPFL. The idea is that um, for the next draft, um, for the next ITF, we are planning to um, finalize some sections that are related to the calculation of the delay bound, uh, which is mostly some mechanism that is um, that, that that can be used in uh, uh, .NET. And uh, we hope that we can finish it in IETF 108, which is in Madrid, I guess, um, to, to have a final version of uh, the whole uh, draft to be uh, to go for the next level. Right. Thank and you very uh, much. for the current for the current state, we had some terminology update and uh, some consistency check uh, for the .NET uh, based on the other drafts that is existing. And uh, that's it. Great. Thank you for the update. Appreciate it. So where are we uh, in terms of our deliverables and milestones? Um, we had a set of core deliverables that were called out uh, when the working group was formed. Uh, we are really in good shape compared to where we were, let's say, a year ago. We have our overall architecture published. We have the core um, data plane documents that have passed last call. And the, um, the DetNet over TSN was the first technology, subnetwork technology that we had called out. And uh, we, those documents are, are close. Um, you'll hear from the authors how close we are. Hopefully, we'll see something IETF 107 that we can get to last call. Uh, the flow information document also is proceeding along, and we do hope to get to um, last call. There was some discussion uh, that you'll hear about uh, between the flow information uh, model authors and the Yang models authors, and there might be some additional updates based on that. Um, the Yang models were, is on the agenda, and that's in process. The other, the other part of it um, that was pretty important that was called out in the charter uh, and my initial milestones was the security document, and we're looking to do a last call uh, by IETF 107. That, too, is on the agenda. We'll get an update. One of the points that came up with our AD is whether to do an early review or just a standard review from the security area. We're actually going to request an early review as soon as the authors tell us that um, they think it's good to go. Uh, <laughs> So we have a question of what's next. And this question is um, uh, based on who would like to contribute to what, and then what the IESG says, is, is our, our ID say is acceptable uh, work activities for the uh, working group. And we've thrown out a couple of items and the um, this the, the intent here is to spend a couple of minutes just uh, getting the reaction of the room, um, but we're aiming towards a, uh, a charter discussion at the next meeting. And some of that charter discussion may uh, also bring in some of the results of the raw boff, where um, that discussion was really, I took it as DetNet over wireless. Um, my, our, no, I'll speak for myself and you can agree. Uh, our hope is, is that uh, that is, becomes a complementary activity, whether the ISG chooses to do it as a, its own working group or within this working group. Either way, as long as the work's done, I think we'll, uh, I think we'll, we should all see it as a benefit. Um, so that may be also something that brings in that we'll have to watch what happens with the ISG as the result of the, of that boff. Uh, so, Lo Anderson, I'm I'm obviously not up to speed, really. So, the security document, what state is that in now? Very close. Huh? Really close to, uh, uh, to working group last call. Last, that, right, and and it's on the agenda, so we'll ha you'll have an okay, opportunity. Okay, I will have a look at it. Yes, thank you. Hmm. I'm, I'm doing in the second group. I'm doing a presentation on it. Be um, either a microphone ah, okay. or away from the mic. Okay. David Black, um, yeah, talking about security documents. So yeah, a lot of good work on, on security documents, a lot of good text in there. However, one of the reasons for requesting an early uh, security area review is the IHF version of no battle plan survives initial contact with the enemy. Uh, we could see some interesting things come out of that review and the sooner, the sooner, the sooner we learn that, the better. Great, thank you. 
So one of the um, reason, one of the items here was a setup for someone who we thought would be in the room, but instead we'll just go talk, refer to his mail list. So Greg Mursky sent uh, a comment to the list about the OEM for MPLS and uh, document. And we had, oh, here he is, and we he didn't come to the mic, so I'll still talk about it. Um, so the uh, he's going to come to the mic. So the we'll give him a minute. Uh, Greg Mursky, ZT. Um, well, um, their authors believe that um, OEM for DeadNet over MPLS network uh, provides their uh, needed technical solution and the document is stable. And we would like to, uh, working group, uh, consider adoption of this uh, work. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. We So we had talked about this at the last meeting and there was some um, moderate support. The issue with why we didn't do an adoption uh, until now uh, was there was very few people who had read it. The people who had read it seemed to like it, but very few. At this point, our feeling is um, we're uh, going to do an adoption call mm -hmm. and see if there's sufficient support. Um, and if there isn't, we'll go we'll go from there. Right. Uh, so, if I may, if I already lean, lean in really close, because I'm sorry, there's just a lot of noise behind. No, no, get close, because there's noise behind that we can't ah, hear. Okay. You. Because actually, I hear it very loudly, so that's why I'm stepping back. Because, um, okay. Um, so uh, you're probably aware that uh, there is another document for OEM over DeadNet IP. I, I've sent some uh, proposal because, um, in our opinion of offers, there is a. A uh, big challenge, uh, uh, technical problem of uh, mapping um, OEM session between endpoints uh, onto their DeathNet IP flow that to be monitored. Um, so I, I, I sent some proposal. I appreciate your comments, thoughts. Let's discuss it on the mailing list. And then once we reach some uh, solution that we agree with, then we'll get to their uh, consideration for adoption of second document. Great. Uh, really appreciate you uh, uh, fostering the discussion in that area. I have, uh, I have a question about the charter. Actually, we uh, it been it has been a while. Uh, we are contribute in the work of SRV six based uh, that net, and the others, including me, uh, are very uh, uh, very confused whether this part of work belongs to the current charter or it will be included in the recharter part. I think it's a good discussion to have. One of the things that we'll have to work out is, um, is that work happen here uh, or in spring? Um, generally, the if you're talking about new data plane mechanisms, you go to the group that owns owns that, unless there's an agreement to do it elsewhere. Right now, they own the data the, the that data plane. Mm -hmm. So we would uh, need agreement from that working group to do it here. Mm -hmm. Without that agreement, we, we're going to assume that it's going to. You would have to um, uh, do the work in spring. So the new, there, I believe, mm -hmm. you have a new data plane mechanism, um, mm -hmm. and that probably will have to be done there. But it's a good topic to raise, and we'll have to work that out with our AD and. Mm -hmm. um, the AD of that group. It's a different AD. So uh, <laughs> we'll have to work that out of where the work happens. Uh, actually, I am uh, totally okay with uh, doing that job in uh, spring. It, it doesn't matter. But I think um, because the MPS based than that and IP based than that belongs than that. So I think maybe uh, naturally SRV6 based than that should belong to than that as well. So uh, I'm a little confused and considering that it is very busy in spring <laughs> recently and, and uh, we ha we have a time slot in spring uh, in previous session, but there is no time left for presentation. And I think even uh, we have some time slot, there will not be a lot of uh, discussions on that 
I think in the current spring stage. Right. I'm sure so, you have to go run over there because it's happening right now, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, as as the author, I prefer to put this part of work in Danette first, I think. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but if uh, um, the chairs or AD have other suggestions, we, we, we can discuss. Yeah. Since mm -hmm. it's their technology, they're really going to have first say. Uh -huh. um, so okay. it's really going to be the the working that working group chairs call and then the ads call. I think okay. uh, you know from our perspective, like we were talking about related to wireless, we'd like to see the work done, and mm -hmm. where it happens is, is secondary. But okay. but they they sort of have to say they don't want it before we can say we want to take it. Okay, so. Uh I will talk with uh, the chairs of uh, Spring first. Sure, and yeah, okay. you know, that will be something that we'll also talk over with R.D. Deborah. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, any other comments? Please feel free to make also follow-on comments uh, <laughs> to the list. Um, another great way to ensure that your topic is included in the discussion for IETF 107 is to have a draft that you can, an individual draft that you bring forward and submit towards the Debt Net Working Group, that will help us make sure that we don't miss your topic. Um, the, this is our last slide on the administrative piece. We wanna give the working group a, a heads up that we're talking about doing another joint session with, um, with IEEE 802.1 TSN. We had a really good session at, in uh, Bangkok uh, after the IETF at the start of the, the um, Bangkok IEEE meeting. So that was exactly uh, a year ago. And it, we're going back to Bangkok next year and the IEEE is meeting the week before us. So the thinking is we would li we'd like to um, uh, propose and investigate doing another joint uh, workshop or uh, uh, meeting on the Saturday before the IETF. So the... Um, IEEE ends on the Friday, we would immediately, the next day, we would have um, the, this meeting. That's the straw man proposal. This is not yet confirmed, um, uh, but we wanted to first let the working group know that this is being discussed. And second, just get a feeling from the room of how many people, A, participated in the last one, so that'll be question one, and then question two is, would be interested or I'm not looking, we're not looking for commitments, but be interested in participating in this next one. So we'll, how many people participated in the last one? Okay, so it's, it's a small number, but a reasonable set. And interested in the, uh, if we have one next year, think they're, they might attend. Uh, so a bit more. So that's, mm -hmm. that, that's helpful. Um, thank you. Uh, Greg Mersky City, uh, question to chairs. Um, you think it will be the same format as more lecture or discussion? It depends a lot. Right, you wanna? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I personally would love to see more discussions. Uh, yes, I agree. that was <laughs> last time. That was the 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 first of this occasion, and um, maybe we should figure out ways to foster more discussion. Okay, yeah, thank what, you. What I agree. Are, one of the other things is depends on how many people show up. And um, we were, when we started, we envisioned a small group mm -hmm. and it turned out to be a really big group. Yes. Uh, and that makes it a little harder to get the discussion, but it's a, it's good input that we should figure out how to have uh, uh, to foster uh, more discussion. I, I think it's okay that we have the first more like introduction to technologies. So might be in the second, we can do something for both uh, parties. Um, more like call for papers and people will submit some uh, proposals for the shorter presentations. So basically break it, not a big presentation that does an overview of a technology, but people talk about specific use cases and uh, problems. Uh, thank you for that. Yep. Good ideas. Okay, we're gonna move now on to the um, the first topic, which is the framework. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Balaj Varga. I will uh, share you where we are with the data frame drafts. Uh, the first presentation is about the framework. Uh, you might remember that we have uh, uh, decided to have a building block approach regarding the data plane drafts. Uh, so that is the first uh, of the A draft. I will speak about each of them. So let's start with the, with the framework. Uh, the current version of the framework document is version three. Uh, this content is quite stable and uh, uh, it, will, it, it is providing an overall framework for a deterministic network data plane. So it is, uh, covers the concept and the considerations that are generally common for any of the deterministic uh, networking data plane uh, specifications. Uh, inside the document, we have sections dealing with the DATnet data plane. There are some encapsulation related uh, uh, consideration that net specific metadatas are also covered. Uh, we have uh, a framework um, uh, topics uh, on the IP uh, data plane and the MPLS data plane, and also some functions, building blocks, uh, and scenarios are covered like service protection, aggregation, and systems, and subnetwork. Uh, in the document, we have also a section dealing with the controller plane considerations. Uh, we have uh, the Sheffer re review for this document, uh, and there was also a work group last call. Uh, it was finished at the beginning of October, and we have received uh, pretty good comments how to improve the documents. So all the clarification and deteriorate changes are uh, resolved in the version three, which is the current version. So based on that, the authors think that it is ready for submission for the EISG. So that is the current status on the framework document. Any questions, comments? Okay. Okay, so the next uh, summary is about four data plane uh, documents. Um, two of them are the IP and the MPLS data plane, and two of them are related to subnet scenarios where that net nodes are interconnected over a subnetwork. For each of these documents, we have a version three, and we will go through all of them. Uh, in the that net uh, IP data plane document, it is specifying uh, the DATnet uh, data plane over an IP packet switch network. Uh, in the current uh, specification of the IP data plane and the format of the DATnet flow, uh, we don't have a sequence number. So that means that uh, from DATnet perspective, uh, we have only a forwarding sublayer uh, related specification. Uh, also, the .NET IP data plane procedures are described, uh, and we have also a section dealing with the management and control information summary. Uh, based on the feedbacks and uh, discussions on the list, uh, there were one uh, technical change in the document, and it is related to the ECN. Uh, that ECN is omitted from the uh, flow identification uh, possibilities. And uh, there is also, there was some recent discussion on the, on the list uh, regarding the use of the five tuples. And um, uh, this is what I have highlighted at the bottom of the, uh, of the slide, that in order to maximize the reuse of five tuple based uh, mechanisms and solutions, um, it is uh, envisioned that uh, end system and uh, that net application should not mix that net and non that net uh, traffic uh, within the same single five tuple. The next document is the MPLS data plane document. Uh, it is dealing with the that net data plane when we have a MPLS based network. Uh, in case of MPLS, we have description for both sublayers, for the service sublayer and also the forwarding sublayer and also the data plane procedures are defined in the document. Uh, 
So the flow identifications, we are using labels and for the sequence number, a death net control word is used. And similarly to the previous uh, uh, data plane document, we have a management and control uh, plane related considerations in the document. Uh, during the, the change of the document, there were only editorial changes and fine tuning. So the technical content of the document has not changed when we have created the version three. And now let's speak about the two uh, uh, data plane documents which are dealing with subnet scenarios. The first is the IP over MPLS document. In that case, two uh, DEFNET IP nodes are interconnected uh, over a MPLS subnet. So that is the scenario that the uh, document covers. Um, it is describing the data plane scenario, the encapsulation, uh, and it is also showing for IP over MPLS procedures how the flow identification and how the traffic treatment is done. And again, uh, as for all the data plane documents, we have a management and control information summary. Uh, the same apply for this uh, uh, document as well. When we have created version three, there were only editorial changes and fine tunings in the document. So it is also pretty, pretty quite stable. And last, uh, let's speak about uh, the scenario where uh, two MPLS DEFNET nodes are interconnected over an IP subnet. Um, yeah, here is a failure on the figure. Uh, so DEFNET over, uh, DEFNET MPLS over DEFNET IP is what we are covering. And this is also the procedures that we are describing. Um, and here again, uh, for preparation for the control lab and discussions, uh, the considerations regarding uh, management and control is also included in the document. That is that uh, document had also just editorial and fine tunings when we have created the version three. So it is quite in a good shape uh, and in a stable format. So uh, currently with the version three of these documents, uh, the Sheffield view were done. Uh, and we have also a very good last call. Uh, it finished uh, 11th of November. Uh, so this version three is the latest version included all the comments that we have for the document during, during the work. And the authors think that these documents are in a pretty good shape. So let, they are ready for submission to the EISG. Any comments, questions? There was a uh, comment that came in this week on the IP document. Do you want to talk to that? Uh, yeah, this is something I have highlighted on the slides. This is not yet included in this format. I will, I, I will make a version for, for that document in order to, to make that happen. And there were also comments regarding the references, normative and informative references. I think this is also something should be cleaned up. That, that was also recently on the on the, on the list. Okay, so for the last slide, you said that it's ready. It sounds like there's one more version before yeah. it's ready. But I think we know exactly what to do <laughs> word by word with that document. So this is why I think that, yes, when that version four are created, then it is ready for the submission. Okay, uh, maybe we can get it done by the end of the session while we're, while, while things are going on, we'll, we'll make the changes and push them in. Get it published. How's that? Yeah, as usual. All right. Thanks. Okay. Any comments, questions? Uh, just a note. Um, it turns out everyone up here is a contributor to this work. So Ethan is actually shepherding this and um, sort of owns owns the documents from a process standpoint. So it's just want to. Make sure everyone knows that. And Ethan, do you want, want to add anything? Not really, except that these are the first uh, Shepherd write-ups I've done, and I still have them marked as you know waiting for review. So I, I appreciate a little bit of input just to make sure that everything's consonant. Okay.
Okay, and now let's speak about uh, three documents where we have uh, also new content uh, from the, uh, compared to the previous version, and they are the TSN related documents. Uh, so we have two data plane documents dealing with .NET over TSN subnet scenario, when we are interconnecting IP or MPLS .NET nodes over TSN network. And the last one is uh, uh, dealing with the scenario when TSN domains are interconnected via a .NET uh, network. Uh, for these uh, documents, we have version one. Uh, version zero was created uh, after the split of the IP and MPLS uh, data plane solution documents. Uh, and these are practically the new documents. Uh, for the documents, we have created a new document structure that is valid for all the three. Um, and we have made uh, at uh, several points clean up and uh, we have also filled up with some text where we had not yet text. So there are new stuff in these uh, uh, drafts. First, let's speak about when two IP.NET nodes are interconnected uh, over a TSN subnetwork. Uh, because we are speaking about the uh, .NET IP data plane, we should uh, take care only about the .NET forwarding sublayer. So this is what is covered in the document. Uh, service protection is not possible end to end. However, in the TSN subnetwork, this is something that you can provide when you are interconnecting the IP uh, .NET nodes. Uh, on the right side, you can see the structure of the document. Uh, uh, just uh, below here, you can see uh, the scenario. So this is the TSN subnetwork and the two IP.NET nodes are interconnected. Uh, the concept to describe uh, this scenario is that we are focusing on IP.NET nodes, which are TSN aware. So this is something you can see here on the right side. So this is the TSN of our talker or listener. So this is the role that IP.NET node uh, plays from the TSN subnetwork perspective. Uh, we have also collected the management and control information uh, related uh, aspects uh, because you have to map the .NET flows to TSN streams uh, when you are crossing that, uh, that subnetwork. Uh, the document is uh, containing requirements for, the, for a TSN-aware IP.NET node. Uh, such nodes are member both the .NET domain and the TSN subnetwork. Uh, within the TSN subnetwork, uh, the, that uh, IP.NET node has a TSN-aware talker or listener role. Um, and uh, the .NET flow IDs and the flow related uh, parameters requirements are mapped to related TSN stream IDs and stream related parameters. So this is a requirement that we, be, that we have to solve uh, when uh, we are speaking about management and control plane. Uh, there is also some interesting scenario uh, uh, when, when you are triggering the setup or a modification of a TSN stream in the TSN subnetwork. Uh, and uh, this is where management and control plane interactions uh, might be required between the .NET and the TSN subnetwork. Uh, the document does not have any requirements on TSN unaware IP .NET nodes because you have no new requirements on them. Uh, however, this is something that we have uh, marked in the management and control uh, consideration that in such a cases, um, it might be even more problematic or more complex to, to start uh, such a uh, triggering uh, between the two domains because the IP.NET node is not at all aware about that subnetwork. Uh, the second uh, subnet related scenario is covered in the, in the next document. Uh, this is the MPLS over TSN. Uh, a scenario where a TSN subnetwork interconnecting two MPLS .NET nodes. Uh, we are speaking about a MPLS data plane, so both the service and the forwarding sublayer are described uh, in the document. Um, 
you can do service protection both in the TSN domain and in the MPLS botnet domain. Um, however, how service protection interworking uh, can be made, uh, this is something that is left for further study in the current version of the document. And here, uh, the concept is very similar to the previous one. So you have your MPLS.NET node, and it should be a TSN aware talker or listener from the TSN subnetwork perspective. So again, you have to map the MPLS.NET uh, uh, flows uh, to TSN streams uh, in the network. Uh, so that means that um, that this MPLS .NET nodes has a TSN aware talker or listener role. Uh, the flow IDs and the related parameters have to be mapped to the streams and the related parameters. And uh, if you have to change anything, you need some triggering uh, and interaction between the management and control plane of the .NET domain and uh, the TSN domain. Uh, the same uh, statement applies for the TSN aware MPLS .NET nodes, as I have uh, said in the in the previous case, and uh, just highlighted again that the service protection interworking scenarios are left for further study. And last but not least, uh, we have a data plane document dealing uh, with the scenario how to interconnect. Uh, TSN uh, domains over a .NET MPLS network. Uh, in this case, the concept is that the TSN stream uh, that is there inside the TSN domain, it is treated as a .NET app flow. Uh, and the .NET domain uh, behaves like a big fat TSN relay node from the TSN domain perspective. Uh, and the service proxy function uh, this is what is uh, making that mapping of TSN uh, streams to .NET flows. And this is what can be treated like, like a port in that big fat TSN uh, uh, relay node. So what we are uh, defining in the document is this whole concept is described and also uh, the TSN over MPLS data plane procedure I defined in detail. Uh, there are some TSN related functions, that not service related, uh, ser service proxy related functions, uh, that not service and forwarding sublayer are also described in detail, and the service protection interworking is also left for further study uh, in that case. But uh, might be interesting to highlight here that we have slightly modified uh, or created this scenario specific version, uh, how this proxy is working with the TSN uh, uh, side of the, uh, of the network. Uh, if you look to, for example, to the architecture document, uh, there is a high level uh, figure. Here in this document, we have a much more precise uh, depiction of those scenarios. Again, management and control uh, plane related consideration. Uh, you have to map the .NET flows and the TSN streams. Uh, and that mapping uh, is something that is happening at the service proxy function of the MPLS .NET H node. And that uh, .NET H node is a member of both domain um, and it is acting from the TSN domain perspective as a, as a TSN relay node. Uh, here again, we need some interaction at the management and control plane when a TSN stream is set up, modified, or tier done. You have to uh, know it in, in the MPLS domain and react accordingly. And just again, highlighting service protection interworking is left for further study. So this is where we are with these documents. Uh, but we intend to have as a next step to, to collect the feedback from the group that uh, where, whether there are any missing items or something that uh, you would like to describe in more detail or somewhat differently. Uh, and uh, then also to add the conformance language to these data plane documents. So that is the plan. Questions, comments? 
Ethan Grossman. Uh, I note in the security consideration sections of these various drafts that they're they're quite small. And in looking at the security considerations for the other data plane drafts, the IP, or, uh, uh, data planes, IP and MPLS, we've been looking in the security group for things that are time sensitive specific and data plane specific. Have you given much thought to that? Are you confident that there isn't anything specific to the TSN of uh, the security considerations for, for these? Uh, or, or do you think that that's a subject that needs further study? This is something that needs further study. So we have identified that this is just something to be, to be done in the future versions. Uh, so this is something to be done. Okay, so presumably we'll fill it. There is a section waiting for that in the security yeah, draft. As, so presumably we're going to fill yeah, it in there. Yeah, yeah. One and, question that came up in just discussing the structure was, well, say we publish the security considerations draft, then we get another data plane, like some wireless thing or something. Then obviously this draft will be closed, so everything will have to go into the, the data plane specific document. So I was just curious whether it's a good idea to keep using this model or whether we should figure we're going to migrate to a model where that information that's specific to that data plane goes in the data plane draft. I think at, at the point, it's for further discussion. So I, I'm happy to have any working solution in order to fill up those sections and so, being in line with the, with the other documents, so. Can I just have a clarification to your question? So you, because actually the security document was gated by the base data plane, actually and the architecture. And uh, my understanding is you want to avoid any kind of situation like saying, this is it for now in the security document and uh, from a borderline, if there is any new data plane draft that has to deal with its own security considerations. Did I get it right that that's what you are after? Yeah, I mean, I don't see how else to do it unless we pull yeah. all the stuff out and, and insist that it goes there now. But since those drafts have already been last called and we couldn't find anything anyway, we're sort of in, at the moment, we're in a consistent state because we couldn't find anything. <laughs> But if we go forwards and we do find something, then it might be interesting. Uh, my view is is the we have a base set of documents where it's sort of the foundational documents. And as we move forward, we can either refer back to those foundational documents and say those it, it, we, we've addressed the security considerations there, or if we identify something new, we do that in the new document. Um, we do have to make sure that those foundational documents do uh, uh, adequately cover the security considerations and um, we will do that and do an early review as we talked about and uh, make sure we have a nice consistent security uh, directorate review of all the documents and they'll keep us honest. Okay. Just to bring an, another example, I mean, SRV6, there are contributions as a new DATNET data plane. I think the S that SRV6 document should have its own security consideration complete. That's my personal view. Okay, so I guess for the IP and MPLS, that one maybe, do we cut it off there and, and say, or do we include TSN and then cut it off after that? What is there right now? Uh, basically in, in, oh, in the TSN one? No, in, no. The security, in the security document. Do you cover TSN or do you not cover TSN? The, there is a placeholder that says to be written. So it's like something that is, there's nothing uh, there. I, I would say cover the core technology and move all the TSN yeah. consider, security considerations to, this, to the TSN document. Okay, I'm and good that with way, that. The, yeah. That way it covers our core technology only. Okay, done. And if you'd like, you can make a statement that that will be covered in, in the technology specific documents and for example, the TSN, and that would be an informational reference. Okay, great. So um, timeline, what are you thinking in terms of having a, a version that you believe is stable enough for uh, last call? Uh, for the TSN documents, you mean? Yeah. Um, I think we need at least two meeting cycle. I'm sorry, that, uh, did, you, did you say one or two? I just two, two meeting cycles. That, that okay. would be my expectations. All right, great. So. Um, 
uh, targeting, um, where are we, Madrid? July, that's Madrid, yeah. Yeah, Madrid, okay. Um, how many have read this version of the document? That's really very few. Um, uh, clearly these documents have not had uh, adequate review to really know what the working group thinks about it. Uh, three working cycles? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> From a process standpoint, I would hope for one, but uh, two sounds, uh, we'll, we'll go adjust uh, our milestones accordingly. Um, I think, you know, aiming for two is, is better than. I, I think the next that we can discuss uh, is uh, when we have also the conformance language. So there I also expect some, okay. some further considerations. So this is why I think that at least two cycles okay. are needed. Keep in mind, we are, contribution driven. So if you um, uh, feel like you're willing, um, please review the document. If you see things that you'd like to see changed, please send the suggested changes to the list. You do enough of those, you get added as a contributor or an author. So there's opportunity here. Uh, uh, I just uh, suggest that maybe we can send this part of work also to the IEEE because I think TSM people may be very interested in uh, how to uh, do the mapping between the DANET and the TSM. Um, because in the uh, previous uh, joint meeting, a lot of people, they are, uh, they are curious about how to uh, use their three uh, deterministic technologies and how to uh, use them with TSN. So I think maybe uh, there will be a lot of potential view, uh, reviewers there in IEEE. That is just a suggestion. Okay, so the suggestion is um, once we have a stable document to send it to the IEEE yes. or is the suggestion to send it to the IEEE as is and say, please help us? Yes. No, the, which, one? which one? Which one? Which uh, one? <laughs> uh, wait think, for state. Wait for stable. Or uh, I think uh, this this version is uh, good enough for send it to. Okay. The so I heard the author. And by the way, I'm not an author on these. Um, I heard the author say that he'd mm -hmm. like to get the um, a serious review once the conformance language was there. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe yeah. wait yeah, until yeah. that. I think uh, I, I would like to also call like the feedbacks regarding the current version. In general, I prefer the practice of sending a stable document to another organization. So uh, it's reasonable. Maybe it's better to do it when it becomes more stable. I mean, without conformance language, it's okay. not uh, it's ready. To do. Actually, I just want to uh, perhaps more reviewers will uh, they will give more feedback to the drafts. But I think when the draft is stable, it, it's also okay. Mm -hmm. uh, good suggestion. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Okay, so the next uh, topic is uh, update on uh, flow information model. Um, I will talk about a uh, bit of a reminders what this is about, and then uh, explain the updates uh, of the draft and uh, and what are the next steps. So. The focus of uh, this document is uh, uh, the pointer. Oops. So the the uh, flow, flow uh, uh, in, information, as the title says, plus uh, the information model for the service. Uh, and this uh, is from the from the document that uh, both the figure and the text what is an information model and what is data model so the subject of this document is uh, the flow information model and the service uh, information model and uh, data models are uh, the subject of uh, the yang uh, document you will hear about uh, after the my presentation um, so what happened since the last ietf we had version 4 for the last IETF uh, and the uh, two updates uh, since then, uh, version uh, uh, six and version five. In um, version five, uh, we had a number of editorial updates uh, uh, in up in the language and uh, count, uh, many clarifications uh, in the text and uh, in, in the attribute formats, for example, making it clear uh, in, in that well-known names are attributes. And uh, the formerly uh, empty placeholder security section has been filled in, security considerations 
uh, have been added. And uh, these were mainly contributed uh, by Don Ferrick, who is now a new uh, co-author of uh, the document. In uh, After that, in version 6, uh, practically speaking, there was one technical change. A new uh, attribute has been added for IP um, flow identification, the IPSec uh, SPI. This is a security parameter index, which is a kind of an identification tag if uh, IPSec is used. So that has been added uh, to the parameter list for flow identification. And uh, just a reminder, <coughs> this is uh, uh, the structure of the attributes. This is what is captured in uh, in the draft. Mm -hmm. So as I as I said, uh, the key parts are the, are the flow and the service uh, uh, information model uh, parts. But it's very important input for these uh, how how we describe an app, app flow application flow. And um, this is many to one mappings from left to right. So multiple app flows can be mapped to a .NET flow, and multiple .NET flows can be mapped to a .NET service. So where we are, what is next? Uh, this uh, first question we keep repeating to the group, and this, uh, is there any missing attributes? And this, uh, um, I would like to ask uh, people to review the draft and, 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 and give comments. On the, the last uh, two items, actually, we had a, a working session, uh, as you saw on the email list uh, last night. And it's very important that uh, to ensure that this document and the Yang document are absolutely in line. Actually, we find uh, some gaps. Uh, Kesong will talk about it in the next uh, slide in detail. And um, this leads to the uh, qu other question. We told before that. It's uh, the flow information model draft is ready as is for working group last call. Now, actually, I would say after filling in these gaps between the two in some form, uh, we think that the uh, authors think hey, we are close and ready for working group last call. So that's it on, on uh, my side, David. David Black, uh, I'm not Greg Mursky, but I'm going to ask an OEM question anyway. And this is actually a bigger scope question of uh, which is the cart, which is the horse, and how do we cope with it? Which is um, MPLS OEM looks like a fairly clean add on via the ACH. IP OEM looks like anything but. How far along do we have to get with IP OEM to figure out that we don't need anything else? It's probably going to be turn out to be mostly in the IP data plane draft if we wind up need, needing to do something clever about flow identification to get the OAM flows to behave. How do we skin this one? That's a good uh, question. And actually, I haven't really seen uh, detailed discussion on this uh, in, 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 on the list. Uh, so uh, yeah, that seems to be a bit of an open question. No ideas have been brought so far. And um, that's a good question in the sense of how do we get done? Because as you, uh, my, my understanding of Greg's points and proposal was to uh, not to bind together the MPLS and the IPOAM, but let the MPLS OAM progress and then uh, progress later as we can with the IPOAM. Uh, um, the one question I heard from your point is, should we hold it, the flow information model back until we, are, we, we get done with the IPO? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what I'm suggesting. What I'm observing is that, uh, as you said, the MPLS OEM, o OEM is clean. Um, it's pretty clear that we, that, that, uh, that yes. we know how to tag the, how to identify the OEM flows as OEM. Um, I think my suspicion is that Greg's proposal affects IP flow identification, and hence is going to hit is going to hit the IP data plane draft, and is going to hit this one. And I do you want? I, I guess the question to you as chairs is how how much do you want somewhere? I, I, the choice is something like: do we push pause and unscramble enough of OEM that we know what it's going to look like? Or do we carry on, get the get the IP data plane done, and then come back and figure out how to do OAM, possibly revving the IP data plane if necessary? 
So, so I think you're really making a comment on the, um, was it two talks ago? Not this one? Quite possibly, um, but uh, it, it's, so it's as good an excuse to ask anything as both as it's, it's going to hit both drafts. Right. So this this is an interesting. Um, uh, sorry, I have to eat the mic. Uh, this is an interesting question as chairs um, because we're also contributors to it. Um, so as with the chair hat on and with uh, what we think is the consensus of the working group, and I'm stating it so anyone can come to the mic and tell us we're wrong, including the AD. Um, uh, as chairs, we've said we're going to define the core, get those out, and keep pushing along and do OEM when it shows up. We've also as made the technical call that um, OEM is going to have to follow the path of the flows, so has to meet our flow definitions. And we certainly have had some conversations of ways that could be done, but we don't have a document. At, 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 you know, Greg got the status right. We don't have a document that gives us an answer yet, so we don't have confirmation of that. Okay, but I from think a process even... standpoint, we're saying we're going to move. We're going to move forward and understand that OAM is going to trail. And yes, we understand that there's risk here, and it's important for the working group to understand there's risk here. And okay. I think you've answered the question, which is that that the work, working group consensus is believed to be that the uh, IP data plane draft needs to move forward without pro, without further fur, fur, further delay. Um, as OEM gets unscrambled, if it impacts the IP data plane, we get to come we 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 get to come back and revise that and deal with that when we get there. Right. And just okay. for your information, I, I even had the conversation this week with Greg about it. Um, some of our thinking on this is to do wait. David, I'm answering your question. If you're distracted, you're not going to hear it. Uh, Stuart, let me finish. So the the um, the thinking is on OAM is that we'll end up having to do some wider flow rules that uh, cover both the OAM traffic and the six tuple for the data flow. And that's probably as good as we're gonna get. Now we're gonna have to run that through the whole process, see if anyone has better ideas, but that's what we think we're gonna, sort of the direction we're gonna end up. So, so, uh, maybe I stepped at the wrong moment or something. This is a this is a pretty jet laggy meeting, but there isn't even a way for regular IP of getting an OAM message um, to be uh, congruent with it. I mean, this is way more fundamental than any problem we're trying to solve here. And, and that's why I gave the answer that I just did, which yeah. is the only thing we have is is we can have multiple flows be congruent by adjusting our flow rules. Yeah, I mean, I just think this is so hard that um, I, we know how to do it for MPLS, but oh, but for um, for uh, IP, I don't think there exists a solution anywhere in the ITF. I, I agree. And so the question for the working group is, do we not push the data plane, the IP data plane document forward and wait until we have an OEM solution, or do we push it forward and try to align our OEM solution with the IP document? Um, that's the question for the working group, and I think you've heard what the chairs think the consensus is. It's opportunity of the working group now to say disagree. Okay, what I think I heard is the latter, which is push the IP data plane document forward to make sense, um, uh, and revising some of your remarks slightly, I would say aligning and modifying, aligning OEM with, with, with IP data plane, modifying the IP data plane if and as necessary. So as a contributor, like, uh, I think we 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 had a, a good job and effort actually made effort to make the IP data plane in line with IP principles, and uh, I think it's good to go. And if we develop OEM, it's a hard problem, but that should be in line with IP principles, anyways. So Pascal Tuber, we you mentioned you asked if all the possible way of signaling a flow were listed in this document, and there's another one which is actually not listed. I was just wondering if you're interested in adding it to it. Um, so if you have a, a Ripple domain, and so you're using Ripple to to do the routing inside that domain, 
Then um, there is work at, at Roll, which actually enables to what, do what we call route projection, which is really installing a route from the route directly into the network. And this, this route is what we call a track in six dish. It's a complex route. I mean, something very akin to what we do here. And it is signaled in the packet using a hop by hop header, which contains some information which is akin to a VRF information. Mm -hmm. So there are local and global VRFs. So, so the local ones that really tie the destination of the packet, which is the exit of this track, with uh, a number which is locally significant there. And that basically tells you which routing table you need to look at to forward this packet. Mm -hmm. And you can have huge numbers of those things in a Ripple network. So that's how we actually signal not really the flow, but the path that this, the flow is supposed to, to go, which also means that you could put, place the OAM and the data on the same path, and they will follow it to the destination, which is the case I wanted to give to Stuart, that we actually have one case where we know how to merge okay. the flow and the IOM uh, into the same thing. So is it something one to capture here, or do you see it as an exception that's not interesting? So w one way I understood you, you, what you said is that that technology is a, a kind of instantiation of uh, explicit routing encoded in the data plane, data packets like Spring. And uh, um, with the benefits of uh, making, so making right? OEM co-routed. So the like Spring can be very, it's more like what you put in the packet is more like topology identification, like a VRFID, not yes. the source route path. Right. Okay. So it's so it's a different overlay. Right. You just I uh, if you if you knew about multi topology routing, that's more like that. Yes. So uh, I think so, it does. so we actually the mechanisms that we built the IP data plane on are closer to policy routing. So if you look at policy routing, you can do very similar things and right. you don't have to have uh, topology and it, you don't have the topology IDs, you have an MRT or the SIDs that you have in Spring. Um, you just have uh, policies. So I think what you're saying is we would want we should pursue a path that um, maps uh, different flows to the same basically policy. Right. The policy tells you which flows go in which rib, and now you stamp the rib in the packet, and the packet follows this rib. The question is, this is how we signal the equivalent of a flow in our packets. Is this something worth capturing? It. You you asked this missing attributes. Well, that that's a flow identification attribute. Uh, uh, well, not really a flow. It's topology, but I see it's something below. It's not a flow. I, uh, as a, it's it's routing, okay. kind of uh, details to do. Them. But 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 uh, that is that can be a good uh, uh, technology choice at a, I, I would say a lower layer, not seen at the level of flow information. But but if uh, we can maybe double check offline if what what you see as a flow information flow ID out of that. Uh, if you I, place I, I only one know. flow plus the OAM into that particular topology, because that's redesigned for it, right? It's, there are many of them, it's designed one per flow. So at some point it's, it's family, but it's not the same thing, so. I, I think it would be great if you could collaborate with Greg on his document yeah. and yeah. try to capture these ideas um, and help us move that, that work forward. Because I, I think it's actually quite, it would fit in quite well. Yes. Okay, thank you. Next, next, next is Yang. So, Kasong, if you could. Uh... Oops. Wait. Okay. You see the clicker? Um, this one? Uh, you're upside down. Here. Forward. Oh, okay. Okay. It works. Uh, uh, this is Xu Song, and I will uh, present our work about the net configuration young model. And thank you for the uh, contribution of other authors. Uh, here is the history of our uh, work. Uh, this, uh, this draft is 
accepted as a working group document after IETF 102. And in the first version, uh, we separate the uh, DANET topology in another document. And in uh, version two, we uh, receive some feedback from the working group and uh, we update the following uh, attributes. We end the uh, sequence number generation considering the OAM. And we end the DANET service decapsulation and also DANET transport tunnel decapsulation. In version three, we uh, do a lot of work about the configuration structure update uh, in ITF 104 and 105. In version four, which is the current version, we modify the scope of the DANET YAM model, uh, mainly to go align with the uh, information model work. And here is the previous version. Uh, basically, we define the DATNET configuration module, which is defined for DATNET flow paths, uh, build, uh, building, uh, flow status reporting, and DATNET functions configurations. Uh, we define th uh, four modules inside the uh, this YAM model, which uh, include the attributes of uh, application flow service sublayer and forwarding sublayer and uh, uh, some network. Uh, this is based on the DANET data plan protocol stack defined in the architecture document. And in this version, uh, we try to do some modification to go along with the structure as the uh, previous slides show. Uh, because uh, in the information model, there is a DATNET service uh, attribute. So we end the DATNET service module to include the service quality attributes, such as the latency, the loss, the misordering. And we also end the endpoints attributes to indicate the start point and the end point of the DATNET service. And maybe the encapsulation type attributes is also needed. Uh, it can be MPS or IP. And we keep the uh, DATNET configuration module stable, just as the previous slides. Um, but uh, after some discussions with the author of uh, information model, uh, there is a call meeting and we also meet each other uh, yesterday and we find that these two modules are, models are still uh, not well aligned yet. So uh, the mapping between the information model and the young model are still to be defined. And we mm, plan to work together after this meeting. Perhaps we will have a call meeting every week to uh, make this work done. And uh, the picture shows that in the uh, left hand is the information model. We see that there are uh, three uh, boxes and in the uh, right hand that is the uh, then uh, oh sorry I, I I write this wrong this is the young, the structure of the young model and uh, we have four elements so maybe how to map the information model uh, attributes to the young model uh, attributes and make it uh, very easy to understand is our next step work and that's all thank you just to clarify uh, the next step, so we are planning to have uh, uh, virtual meetings, working sessions, like uh, we are having for the data plane announced on the list to to move uh, forward. I don't think it will be weekly. We will need to figure out when, but uh, that's part of the plan. David Black wearing transport area tech advisor hat. Small request, um, we, we've talked about it in the past. As you work towards the next revisions draft, which looks like a lot of work, um, there is still in, in this version, uh, the DSCP and the DSCP bit mask pair that needs to be changed to a DSCP list. Just, it's a, it's a small item that should be dealt with sooner or later. Thank you. I, I think we're going to end up with a major revision. Um, one of the comments that I saw is, is it's, it's very, yeah. it's very flat and not taking care, taking into account sort of, um, some of the layout you'd want to have an extensible fr uh, foundation for future augmentation and, so yeah. I think you're going to see. Uh, oh, I'm I'm expecting major changes. Yeah. I'm just uh, let's let's check this box now, so we don't have to go back and discover. Oops, we forgot to check it three versions from now. That's all. Uh, David, uh, if I understand this right, I I remember that you have very similar comments in the previous uh, meetings. So uh, we haven't updated the draft based on your uh, comments. I, I remember I've done this. 
It's okay. Let's just, let's just, let's just, since, since there's clearly major vision coming, let's just yeah. simply check, check, check the box while we're there. No problems. Okay, thank you. If you find that there is still something wrong, please uh, let us know by the mailing list. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we're actually um, running uh, a bit ahead, which is right, which is pretty rare, um, which is actually really good because um, our tech advisor, David uh, Black, can't be here for the second session and really wanted to be here for the security document. If uh, the, if Ethan, if you're willing, can you go now? Yeah. Great, so we're gonna move that um, slot up. I'm Ethan Grossman, and this is an update for the security considerations draft. So the intent of the draft is to be a reference and a toolkit for network designers who have not necessarily dealt with time-sensitive networks before. Uh, so this is relatively new in the IETF, so we were figured we'd have a clearinghouse for that kind of information. So this document doesn't address the general uh, considerations for security for IP and MPLS networks. We leave that to the existing documentation. We're very focused on only the time specific aspects of it. And the uh, relation of this drafts to the security consideration sections in the other uh, DetNet drafts is that basically each of those drafts is to have its own security section addressing issues specific to that particular draft topic, but then having a reference to this draft to cover all of the more general uh, technology independent and, and other considerations that that way we don't have to duplicate these many pages in, in each draft. So at the moment, the technology independent section, in other words, regardless of whether you're on an IP based uh, network or MPLS, uh, that section is fairly mature at this point. This draft's been running for nigh on two years, and we've had a fair number of eyes on that part, and if there's a fair amount of organization. Uh, there's a few little pits to fit in, fill in, but that part's pretty mature. The thing that we thought we were really going to do as the next big thing was the IP and MPLS specific sections. We thought, well, there's got to be stuff that's specific to both uh, time-sensitive networks and the IP uh implementation versus the MPLS implementation. So we've had as many people as I could manage to wrangle into discussing this, uh, look at this, and so far the result is that we haven't really found any unique threats that are both related to time sensitive and not covered in the general case, but are specific to that data plane. So we have, later I, I have, hoping we can have a little bit of conversation, but maybe it'll just get deferred to the list. But my sense is that if you've ever read uh, read the Gladwell book about Blink, there's this thing where people who have been doing something uh, for a long time just have a certain sense of intuition, but it's not just intuition from nowhere, it's intuition from many years of working on it. So I guess what I was asking is that if you could think about that statement, I mean, at the moment our stance is there's nothing technology specific about these. So we've got sections in the security draft that say IP, nothing specific, it's all just the general stuff. MPLS, nothing specific, just the general stuff. Does that ring true or does that leave a bad feeling in your stomach? Because I haven't gotten anybody to come with anything specific, but I'd settle for a general feeling about it. So that's just one way to approach what to me at the moment is kind of an intractable problem, is trying to figure that out. So. That's one thing. So the TSN specific section we discussed a little earlier is not uh, started yet, but we're going to defer that to the, the uh, TSN specific draft. So that's off of my plate. Good. The uh, other thing that is, I'm in a quandary about going forwards is this in the use cases draft, if you've read it, you know that it, at the end of it, I sort of collected all of the related security related statements from every other draft that I could find at the time. It hasn't picked up the new ones. 
uh, lately, but basically, particularly from the use cases draft, because there were like all these little kind of funny statements, and there's not really a requirements document. So I thought, well, how is anybody going to review the security draft without understanding what the criteria and the requirements are? So I said, well, I'll collect all these things. That's as close as we have. And that way, people can look at those and say, well, this is kind of what's expected. Do we think that we're covering the territory? So my question is, well, what do I do with that stuff? I mean, do I leave it in the draft? If I do, then there's a process of updating it and make sure I've got all the stuff to date that's been added since you know, that was last worked on, which was many months ago. Um, or do we just chuck it and figure it doesn't really belong in the security draft? Anyway, interesting questions to ponder. Uh, we may have a second for a discussion if we do. And uh, we'd like to, I'd like your input on that. I will. Okay. So I look forward to your input any minute now. Right now. Discussion. Okay. So there were three questions that I had intended to ask. Um, one of them, the third one, we've already actually managed to resolve about the security directorate review. Is it going to be before or after working group last call? And we decided that we would go for it at the beginning of last call. We would also submit for an early review. In other words, it would be for, before it was passed to the ISG, we would also have the security directorate have a look at it first in parallel with our working group last call. So I'm happy to uh, have that result. Um, the other couple things are about the data plane technology specific things. Does anybody have any thing to say about that? And the uh, security related statements from the use cases, any thoughts about that? So David Buck is one of the people who drew a blank on data plane technology specific threats. I thought I would come to the mic and explain why um, my gut feel is that it's okay or I'm not really upset about it, and let, let's just see if I can get somebody up to the up the microphone to debate me, and we'll learn something. Uh, reason is that the security considerations draft is very much written from a threat model perspective. It takes a general functional model of uh, time-sensitive networking and outlines all the various threats that could disrupt that. At that level, it's got pretty complete threat coverage. Now, if I plug a data plane in underneath that time-specific uh, uh, networking, I wind up refining that general functional model to the specific manifestation of data plane. The threats haven't changed, but how they impact the data plane probably has. But with the security draft having been written, written primarily in terms of threats and not in terms of specific manifestations in the data plane, the fact that we can't find any new threats against the data plane is not that big a surprise. An interesting point, good point. Does that mean that we should be talking about those specific impacts on the specific data planes? Or does it mean we're sticking with threat models and call it good? I think you cast the die, I think the die was cast a while ago to write the secure, the, the overall security draft as an overall deterministic networking security draft and that leads to its current threat model structure. So I'm not criticizing that trying to just sort of, sort of have a look at, is there a gap there? And the answer is, well, no, it's, are there, did, did, did implementing deterministic networking on a specific data plane add new threats to deterministic networking? Perhaps not. No, but I, I understood what you said, I thought, but my question was, we haven't, we specifically did not address the impacts on a specific data plane. Is this a place where we should be thinking about that and not be talking so much about the threats, but about, the, so is that right. a subject from a, tr from a truth and beauty perspective, I would say no. That when when you're looking at a threat to a specific data plane mechanism, that's a security consideration for that data plane draft. So another way of uh, I, David, I like the way you phrased that. It actually triggered some additional thoughts um, uh, that I hadn't had. So the the you know what's really different. By the way, this is Lou as contributor, not as chair. Okay. Um, uh, what's really different between the different data planes is how we do flow identification. That's about it. And so maybe we should focus on that and, and highlight even in your general section about technology specific threats to articulate that the difference between them is how we identify flows. And so the additional threat there or vulnerability, whatever the right word is, um, is that it, it, it may be easier or harder for 
one flow to impersonate another flow or to um, uh, potentially deny services be based on the number of fields that are used. But that, that's really about it between the technology specifics. The rest of it is all about service and that's gonna be 100% common. And when we get OAM done, we'll have another difference. Right. Right. Okay, so the next steps we're looking at are to basically at this point, finish it up and, and get through working group last call and uh, security review. Great, thank you. So uh, we still are running a little bit ahead, but I think if we try to squeeze in another, we might um, uh, run it, make run out of time in the session. So what we're gonna do now is uh, break until the second session. The second session is back in this room in uh, half an hour. So instead of a 20 minute break, we're gonna have a half hour break. So see you all here at 5.40. Thank you. Yeah, I, I remain really, really worried that none of us understand the, the threat models properly. Because when you deploy it in a network, um, I don't think I, there are so few people who have any experience yes. of large so, type sensitive networks. Yeah. Yeah. And I really think that this, this is an it, it, it's, it's, it's an industry issue. That there will be all kinds of interesting threats and, and attacks that uh, we haven't even thought of yet. Because I moved to have this up in the future sort of network. They really want ultra-reliable, ultra-stable delays and all those sorts of things. They just run TDM. <laughs> so, seriously, I mean, that's yeah, or a piece of real wire. Well, that's history. I mean, that's what people have been doing. That's what we're trying to move away from. Yes, yes. The, the other thing to we might want to watch out for is that um, a lot of people, when they think they buy a wire or a, you know, an Ethernet service, for example, from you know, A to B from the carrier, aren't buying what they think they're buying. They're buying uh, a multiplex. Sorry? A slice. <laughs> yes. Well, mm -hmm. well, not even a slice. I mean, you know, they're often buying a multiplex service. Yeah. So, um, if anyone missed signing the blue sheet, either raise your hand or come on up here. I'm not sure that we do our best. And almost like OAM, it's like to a certain degree, you just have to get the thing out there and then find out what happens. So. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, that's the other thing is once it gets out in the wild and isn't limited to you know, our, our small group. But I, I, I think group. maybe we need to be honest about it when we write the security documents. That okay. This is, for a lot of this is really new territory. And the, um, the, the, the type and scope of threats are not well understood by the industry. Um, we can phrase it somehow. No, you can probably find a more politically. Yeah, 